So our first speaker today is Dr. Raphael Donchev, and he is a postdoc at Fred Hutch uh, in the Steve Hahn's lab, just down the hall from me, actually. <laughs> so, um, and he uh, did his PhD in um, at the Ludwig Hertzfeld Institute of Immunology and Experimental Therapy in Poland. And that's where he studied the um, characterization of H. pylori OEC region, which is actually really quite cool. He went from H. pylori all the way to yeast uh, transcription. So that's really fascinating. And um, he also, before that, got a master's of science um, studying uh, gene expression in uh, Streptomyces color, silly color. Sorry if I can't pronounce bacterial names. Um, but anyway, yeah, so you have a really great um, background in microbial biology, and now you're doing really cool work in eukaryotic transcription. I want to say Raffle's been an amazing colleague down the hall, too. He's always been really helpful with answering questions and doing really cool research, too. It's always a joy to be able to um, talk science, uh, even during the pandemic. Uh, so thanks so much for presenting today, and I'm really excited to hear your seminar. So without rambling on too much, I'm going to leave the floor to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for this kind introduction, Christine. And let's see. All right. So this is my first slide. So again, thank you for the introduction. And uh, today I will try to try to present you the main results of the work, which provided me with evidence that yeast bromodomain factors, BDF1 and 2, are first essential for transcription of a large, large set of yeast genes, but also that they have important roles both during initiation and surprisingly elongation stages of transcription. So just a few introductory slides. So we probably all know, but Maybe for some, some people it will be helpful to go over the basics that the transcription in eukaryotes starts with activators, which bind to upstream activating sequences. And usually they recruit co-activator complexes. And co-activators ha can have multiple roles. Uh, they can remodel chromatin, they can introduce post-translational post modifications, or they can nucleate the assembly of the pre-initiation complex. Some of these uh, complexes have a uh, like, direct role in the formation of the peak. In the next stages, with the help of co-activators, uh, basal factors are loaded to the promoter region, followed by polymerase II, and the transcription begins at a specific location, which is called transcription start site. And uh, productive elongation is supported by elongation factors, which associate with polymerase. About 17 years ago, the group of, of Frank Pew proposed that these genes depend on one of the two co-activators, TF2D or SAGA, and the resulting classification was really helpful for many subsequent studies. And uh, recently, both our and other labs uh, revisited these concepts, and last year we proposed an updated classification system of these genes. For that, we used the auxin inducible Degron system, them, uh, to achieve, and we couple that with nascent RNA sequencing, and uh, to achieve rapid depletion of either selected Saga subunit, subunits, TF2D subunits, or simultaneous depletion of both activators. And uh, in the heat map, I plotted the log to change in transcription of representative experiments. And as we can see, a large subset of these genes uh, seems to depend exclusively on TF2D. In this, ex, uh, in this essays, and we call these genes TF2D dependent. And the smaller subset, uh, which overlaps with the previously defined saga dependent genes in about 50%, depends on both co activators. So there's some dependence on saga and TF2D, and these genes are substantially affected only when both co activators are depleted at the same time. That's why we call these genes co activator re redundant. Despite years of research, it is still unclear how TF2D is loaded to the chromatin, um, both in yeast and in more complex uh, metazone systems. So in metazone promoters, there are other sequence elements different from the well-known Tata box, and some of them were shown to interact specifically with uh, certain TF2D subunits, but all these sequence elements are missing in yeast. And uh, metazone, TF2D also has two chromatin reader domains. So there's a 
PhD finger on TAF3, which interacts with methylated histone H3, and there is also a double bromodomain on TAF1. Again, the NEST TF2D is missing both of these domains, and as we can see, the East TAF1 is significantly shorter than its human homologue, right? Interestingly, uh, the group of Steve Boratowski proposed a long time ago, actually proposed, they found that these bromodomain containing factors, BDF1 and 2, specifically interact with TAF7. And based on that interaction, they propose that BDF1 and 2 constitute this missing part of human TAF1. And then they, the, this way, they provide a bridge connecting yeast TF2D complex with chromatin marks. Later, based on the sequence homology, BDF1 and 2 were also classified as members of the broader, broader BET family. This is a sub, uh, subset of bromodomain containing family. And uh, this family is characterized by the presence of two conserved bromodomains in the N terminal region, BD1, so there is BD1 and BD2. And there is also the well conserved ET domain in the C terminal region. And later, some other conserved features were also described, including motifs A, motif B, and the seed domain. Uh, but the functional role of this of these domains is not so well understood. What is important is that human BET factors uh, are the major driving force in development of multiple cancers uh, because they were shown to control expression of important oncogenes like MYC and others. What is known is that they interact with acetylated chromatin in the promoter and enhancer regions, and they were also shown to interact with other factors, including coactivator mediator and elongation factor PTFB. They are known to assist in mediator recruitment to promoter and enhancer regions, and they were also proposed to form common nuclear condensates with mediator, at least at some super enhancers. Still, uh, it is unclear what is their actual biological role except the recruitment of mediator. For example, it is not known if they are assist in PTFB recruitment may, or if they are able to simulate its activity or maybe they have some other role which uh, leads to productive elongation. One thing is clear, like recent work based on, uh, based on rapid depletion of all the BET factors followed by RNA-seq shown that uh, the role of human BET factors is not limited to certain lineage-specific genes, like was previously believed, genes which may control growth or cell cycle progression, but rather they serve as general activators of uh, polymerase to transcription. And the second thing which became clear recently is that they have important roles both during the initiation and elongation stages of transcription. So after this initial finding that BDF1 and 2 uh, are able to interact with TAF7, uh, the roles in these transcription were never examined in details. And since they were classified as members of this super interesting BET family, uh, I hypothesize that they may constitute yeast equivalents of human BT factors. And the phylogenetic analysis I'm showing in the upper panel uh, proved that BDF1 bromodomains are more closely related to BRD4 bromodomains than to TAF1 bromodomains. So that was really interesting. There is a clear difference in, uh, in evolutionary uh, like conservancy of amino acids. Also, there is also a pretty good similarity between other conserved domains, motif B, ET domain, and the seed, dom seed domain between BDF1 and BRD4. Obviously, this, this analysis does not prove that they have been, uh, that they are functional homologues in the yeast system. So to explore their, uh, their role in yeast transcription, I took advantage of this powerful combination of rapid protein degradation with, nascent, with sequencing of nascent RNA. And I, I degraded either BDF1 alone, BDF2 alone, or uh, I degraded BDF1 in the BDF2 gene deletion background. Um, and that experiments were followed by sequencing of 4 labeled nascent RNA. 
Uh, in the left panel, uh, the y-axis shows the change in transcription, and the x-axis is the logarithm of, of wild-type expression level. And as we can see, depletion of BDF2 alone, or BDF2 gene deletion, which I'm not showing here, they have minimal effects on transcription. Basically, no genes are affected. Depletion of BDF1 causes modest changes, like but many, many genes are going down at least twofold or so. And these changes become much way more pronounced when BDF1 degradation is coupled with BDF2 deletion or BDF2 degradation. And in this experiment, uh, the median change is about eightfold. So this is becoming really substantial. Uh, what's important, the results of BDF1 de depletion and depletion of both BDF1 and 2 correlate well. And this experiment actually is consistent with hypothesis proposed previously that BDF1 and 2 have redundant roles with BDF1 being the dominant factor. Since BDF1 and 2 were proposed to associate with TF2D, uh, obviously the, in the next step, I compared my new results obtained for BDF1 and 2 depletion with our previously published results obtained uh, following TAF1 depletion or depletion of other TF2D subunits. In the scatter plot, we have the results of TAF1 depletion on the y axis and BDF1 to depletion of the x-axis, and the points are labeled by our two new gene categories. And what was really surprising for us at that point is that uh, the results are correlated, but there is a large subset of TF2D-dependent genes which shows at least twice or even thrice or four times higher dependence on BDF1s, BDF1 and 2, than on TAF1. And on the other hand, almost all coactivator redundant genes are more dependent on TF2D than on BDFs. Um, in the box plot on the right, we, again, we have log to change in transcription on the y-axis. And when we look at the results of BDF1 and 2 experiment, we can see that B, this, the results of this experiment actually seem to serve as a better predictor of our new gene classification than the results of TF2D experiments here represented by TAF1 or TAF14 depletion. So again, we see that coactivator redundant genes are only weakly, few of them are affected in this experiment based on BDF's depletion, and many, many TF2D dependent genes are way more affected. And to establish the baseline for the maximum loss of transcription we can track with this, uh, with this system we have, I also degraded subunits uh, of two basal factors, TF2A and TF2H. And I found that we can reproducibly observe 16-fold and even higher changes. And in case of basal factors, both gene classes are equally affected, which makes perfect sense. So there are two main conclusions here. First, majority of TF2D genes show a stronger dependence on BDF1 and 2 than TF2D, while almost all, co all coactivator redundant genes are more dependent on TF2D. And second, BDF1 and 2 uh, clearly cooperate with TF2D in controlling transcription of many genes, but they also likely have independent functions. So this synergy of function between BDF, uh, BT factors and TF2D was also proposed in mammalian system, although this, this is not very well explored. So in the next step, I decided to compare genome-wide binding patterns of BDF1, 2, and TAF1. So for that, I used uh, CheckSeq, which, which is a precursor of Cut and Run developed in Hemikov lab here at Fred Hatch, uh, and is based on genomic fusion of your protein of interest with micrococcal nuclease. As we can see in this average plot uh, on the left, so the plot is showing the average signal genome wide centered on TSS for BBF1, 2, and TAF1. The binding profiles of all three factors are very similar, and this is also uh, visible, I guess, in the this genome browser snapshot on the right. So all three factors show very similar binding profiles. So in the next step, I called peaks on this data and I assign peaks to promoters and compare the overlap of promoters. And what we can see in the Venn diagram here is that BDF1 and 2 show extremely extensive overlap. So basically they clearly bind to the same promoters with BDF1 having consistently stronger signals, which agrees with its dominant role. There's also a very good overlap between BDF1 and TAF1 bound promoters. 
Uh, so I divided this bound promoters into our two gene classes, and I calculated the, the percentage of promoters in each class bound by each factor. And as we can see in the bar plot here, BDF1 and 2 clearly prefer TF2D dependent genes over coactivator redundant genes. TAF1 doesn't show any preference. And these results are consistent with results of RNA-seq experiments, where TAF1 seems to have a more important role on coactivator redundant genes than PDFs and vice versa for TF2D dependent genes. To explore what mechanism may be driving this, uh, the gene dependence on BDF1 and 2, I used CheckSeq to track changes in chromatin occupancy of TF2D, so selected TF2D subunits. Here I'm showing TAF1 and TAF11 experiments, or mediator subunits, MED8 and MED17, two head subunits. To remind you, mediator well, is known to be recruited by BET factors in the mammalian system, and it was also proposed to co form common nuclear condensates with BRT4. So uh, in the plots, the dashed line corresponds to the sample which is depleted for BDF1 and 2. And the plots are divided into TF2D and coactivator redundant categories. And as we can see, depletion of BDF1 and 2 affects recruitment of both complexes. And both classes of genes, surprisingly, uh, seem to be similarly affected. So. Uh, what was important at that point is that mediator and TF2D were proposed to affect each other recruitment in the literature. And I revisited this concept. So I applied CheckSeq again for that. Uh, I was able to confirm the interplay between TF2D and mediator. But the changes I observed in these experiments were relatively small. So in the box plot on the right, uh, uh, I quantified these changes. Uh, so we have log to change in binding on the y-axis. And we are looking at the results of depletion of BDF1 and 2 or mediator or TF2D on the other side. And we are tracking changes in TF2D or mediator recruitment. And as we can see, the results of depletion, the results of experiments based on BDF1 and 2 depletion consistently show stronger changes than the corresponding experiments, which suggests that BDF1 and 2 have independent roles in recruitment of both TF2D and mediator, at least independent of TF2D and mediator. Uh, so importantly, the changes even in BDF1 and 2 depletion experiments were not dramatic. So that was, that was around twofold in most cases. So there's at least 50% of TF2D and mediator content, which seems to be BDF um, independent, right, at the promoter. So, why all this large, large loss of transcription we observe? So uh, in the next step, I decided to look at the possible problems with the formation of the pre-initiation complex. And for that, I performed CHIP-seq against a basal factor TF2B uh, in BDF1 and 2 background or TAF13 background background. And first thing which is clear from this average plots is that depletion of either BDFs or TF2D results in general loss of transcription. Here I'm plotting all genes uh, in both categories. So TF2D dependent genes are generally more affected than coactivator redundant genes, but all genes are losing signal. And in the scatter plot on the left, uh, I plotted the log to change in TF2B binding on the y axis and uh, the log to change in transcription on the x axis, both following BDF1 and 2 depletion. Uh, again, the, as we Elder on show, so for TFTD experiment, uh, the results are pretty well correlated, but there is a substantial set of genes, very BDF dependent, which are losing lots of transcription, but they are not losing so much of TF2B at the promoter, and vice versa. There is this smaller subset uh, of genes which are BDF independent, but they are still losing TF2B. So that was that was surprising and suggested that BDFs may have roles which extend beyond transcription initiation. And importantly, BT factors in mammals are known to regulate productive elongation. Mostly, they regulate the post-release step. And well, uh, at that point, I hypothesized that maybe, maybe even though we don't have posing in yeast, maybe, maybe BDF1 and 2 have some similar roles in the yeast system. So for that, I performed CHIP-seq uh, against RPB1. 
uh, both following BDF1 and 2 depletion, not F1 depletion. And in the scatter plots, we are comparing the change in RPB1, total RPB1 occupancy at the transcribed regions versus the change of transcription. And again, similarly as for TF2B, in case of BDF1 and 2 depletion, most BDF dependent genes are losing more transcription than they, they, are, than they are losing polymerase. And the least BDF dependent genes are losing polymerase without losing transcription. No such differences were observed for TAF, uh, following TAF1 depletion. That's very important, I guess. And so I, at that point, I had this idea that maybe there are some changes in the polymerase distribution along the gene, because here I just calculated the total signal between transcription start site and transcription termination site. So to answer that question, I calculated the so-called traveling ratio, which I defined here as the ratio of RPB1 at TSS versus the ratio of polyadenylation site. The genes in the box plot are sorted by dependence on BDF1 and 2 from the least to the most most BDF dependent genes, and the red color corresponds to sample depleted for BDF1 and 2, or TAF1 on the right. And as we can see, for most BDF dependent genes, I observe an increase in the traveling ratio. Many of them, are, uh, at many of them, the traveling ratio increases twofold or, high or more at this very like small subset of most BDF dependent genes. And for the least BDF dependent genes, there is a decrease in traveling ratio. So the increase of traveling ratio may suggest less, uh, less productive elongation. And here, the, the decrease may suggest more productive elongation. So that provides an explanation why cultivator redundant genes generally are BDF independent in RNA seq experiment, but they are still losing RPB1 and basal factors and cultivators, and why certain TF2 de dependent genes seem to be very like, let's call it BDF hypersensitive. So they are losing disproportionately large, large uh, set of um, large part of transcription with smaller losses of uh, both RPB1 and cultivators. No similar changes, maybe very weak trend at the very ends of the spectrum were observed for TAF1. And to ex expand it a little more, I Perform chip seek against phosphor phosphorylated serine 2 and serine 5 residues on the RPB1 C terminal domain. Uh, and I divided, I normalized the signal by total RPB1 uh, occupancy. So in the end, I calculated the change in phosphorylation status following BDF1 or TAF1 depletion. And the, the, pl the plot is the, the plot is constructed similarly as the previous one. So genes are sorted from the least to the most BDF dependent genes. And as we can see, for most BDF dependent genes, uh, we observe hypophosphorylation. So many of them are becoming hypophosphorylated mostly on serin 2 uh, and serin 5 in a limited way. And many genes which are BDF1 independent are becoming weakly hyperphosphorylated. So this result is consistent with the changes in the traveling ratio I showed you earlier. And again, importantly, no such differences I observed for F1 depletion experiment. So uh, the results I showed you today provided evidence that BDF1 and 2 are essential for transcription of genes classified as TF2D dependent, but these factors have functions which are separate from TF2D. So uh, based on my results, I propose a model where BET factors and yeast are recruited to acetylated chromatin. And uh, they serve as, once anchored to chromatin, they serve as nucleation centers for TF2D and mediate recruitment. And I imagine that this function of BET factors is complementary to the function of sequence transcription factors which occupy the UAS. And in turn, TF2D and mediator serve as a for recruitment of the components of the pre-initiation pre -initiation complex. The second role of both uh, BDF1 and 2 takes place during elongation, where they seem to act as negative regulators, generally at coactivator redundant genes, and positive regulators at TF2D dependent genes. And finally, I propose that BDF1 and 2 constitute yeast equivalents of human BT factors, and that the cooperation between 
BT factors, TF2D, and mediator is a conserved feature of eukaryotic gene regulation. With that, I would like to finish by thanking uh, all the amazing members of my lab, especially Steve and Linda, for help discussion and really great atmosphere in the lab. And I would also like to thank the members of Tsukiyama Lab, Christine, Toshi, and Sarah, uh, for help and lots of like uh, lots uh, deep talks we all very often have about science and help in setting up the chipstick experiments in our lab. And also, obviously, thank you all for your attention. Thanks so much. That was a fantastic talk. We are running short on time though, so I'm only going to ask one question. So the first or the question that I'm going to take for this uh, talk is from Apoorva uh, and he's asking for TF2B chip seek data. Did you find any differences between BDF1, 2 sensitive and non-sensitive gene, sense, gene sets upon motif search and the promoter peaks? Like for example, one gene set was enriched in Tata box and another not. So generally, the, this is a great question. And it seems that dependence on TF2B generally follows the rules uh, I found in RNA seq So uh, most of the TF2D dependent genes tend to be Tata less. Obviously, there are some Tata containing among them, but generally not. And the least BDF dependent genes activator redundant genes or saga dependent genes previously defined uh, tend to be enriched for tata containing promoters although nothing is clear cut here right uh, but that that would answer the question that generally you would expect that tata less genes are very strongly bdf dependent and tata containing genes are not and same applies to the observed losses in tf2b recruitment great thank you so much